Turn your attention to, with me then to Acts chapter number 9 as we prepare to take a, a look at the Word of God and invite uh, the Scripture to help guide us as we continue in our celebration of mothers and caregivers and uh, all of the roles that moms and maternal figures and matriarchs play. Uh, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful gift to be in such a great, great uh, season, right still in the middle of resurrection. And uh, I always am blessed by the many ways that uh, resurrection continues to inform the way in which we celebrate mothers and celebrate our caregivers and all the many roles that moms play. And, and this passage, which is part of our lectionary passage, really spoke to me in a way where I, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to continue to expand the notion of mothers beyond just a very uh, kind of narrow sense, but just the actions and the activity of what I'll call mothering. That I believe that mothering is an act that we are all called to live into. And on this Mother's Day, as we celebrate our mothers, may we also keep imagining how we all are called into the act of mothering. Acts chapter 9, verse 36, this is the, the book of the actions of the apostles or the disciples, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, both ministry and resurrection. Uh, it is so fascinating when you just continue to think about what kind of experience these individuals, both men and women, wealthy and poor, learned and uh, on their journey to learning, right? Uh, all of these folks with varied experiences all seem to have a similar testimony that compelled them even to the point of death to proclaim that there has and was a man and a life and a way of living that they refuse to denounce and even, dare I say, refuse to reject. And I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to look at the early actions of these disciples, these apostles, these followers of Jesus, and continue to imagine what resurrection living uh, means for us uh, some thousands of years later as we continue to strive to be faithful in our own time and place. Acts chapter number 9 then picks up uh, the story of Peter. Uh, if you were here last week, you may remember we were uh, talking about Paul and and his conversion. Well, we switched over into uh, another one of the disciples whose name is Peter. And this is where we'll pick up in his story. Verse number 36, 37. Now down the road, or now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. And she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. All that time, or at that time, she became ill and she died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. And since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when Peter arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter then put all of them outside and knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. And this became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to uh, continue in this kind of year-long theme around igniting. I want us to imagine uh, leaning into this challenge of igniting mothering, igniting the act of mothering. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to hide the word of God that has been read in our heart so we will not sin against you. And as we seek to preach and teach your word, I pray that 
the anointing that makes teaching easy may rest upon all of us and even the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the Lord say amen. 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 You know, one of the, the great gifts of Mother's Day in its most traditional sense is that it seeks to celebrate and elevate the role that mothers and caregivers in our lives uniquely provide. It seeks to remind us and reinforce the uniqueness of mothers who bear children, who nurture children, and steward children from their early years into their adulthood. It also seeks to amplify the spectrum, if you will, of caregiving that happens in our communities, knowing that at our best, Mothers, moms, matriarchs are intergenerational sources of life. Amen. You know, if you hang around certain folks in their particular cultures, amen, you'll hear folks describing uh, 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 the, the, the unique role that mothers, moms, caregivers, uh, nanas, big mamas, you know, uh, 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 we used to call my grandmother, uh, my mom, my, my dad's mother, uh, Grandma G., Amen. And she was a G, so I'm saying man. And she was she was uh, she was from North Carolina and she was filled with joy, but she didn't play. Somebody say amen. And then uh my, my mom's mom was was Grandma Hampton and, and we we just had all these interesting, unique experiences. I can still remember today how my grandma Hampton, uh she was from Texas and she taught me how to play dominoes. Amen. And I would hang out with her, and I was young, 8, 9, 10, and she would pull out the coffee table, and, and she uh, was differently abled. She had lost one of her legs in an accident when she was young, and, and so she would have her, her big chair, and she would say, come on over here, Michael, I'm going to teach you how to count. Amen. And I've been counting ever since. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. She, 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 she taught me how to play dominoes. And then I remember Grandma G, you know, whenever we had our, our birthdays and our holidays, we could always count on Grandma G to give me some uh, paper. You know, they used to sell paper in plastic. Do they still do that today? They do? Okay, I don't know. It's all new. I don't even know people use paper like that. You know, but, you know, when you're going into school, school supplies, she used to give us paper and pencils. And then for Christmas, we would get socks. Literally, my whole life, it became so consistent. She would wrap it up, and we'd be like, I don't know why it's wrapped up, Grandma. We, <laughs> we know what it is. But what I learned from both of them, while it was similar, it was different. They had a unique contribution that even though my grandma Hampton is no longer here, my grandma G is coming up on her 90th birthday. Amen, we're gonna celebrate 90 years, amen, in August. Uh, they both still have such an imprint on my life. And we also know that this day, rightly so, uh, also requires us to make room for the, the strained relationships that mothers may have with their daughters or daughters with their mothers or across the spectrum of generation. Uh, I, I, I love this, this message that was sent out this morning. It says that we're thinking of you mothers who have lost children. We're thinking of you mothers who, uh, those who have lost mothers. We are thinking of you those with strained mother relationships. We are thinking of you mothers with strained child relationships. We are thinking of you those who have chosen not to be mothers, we are thinking of you, those yearning to be mothers. That the experience of mothering cannot be essentialized through the sole act of bearing children. But it cannot be lost upon us that that act also reminds us of the source and the foundation by which much of our lives continue to thrive. Now, you know, uh, of course, uh, it, 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 it's worth saying that uh, all of us are here because of a mother who gave birth to us. Amen. It's not a deep, spooky 
rocket science declaration, amen. It's just, I hear it's science, amen, and something that we know. And yet we also know that there are so many roles that mothers play in our life that it is worth pointing out the gift that not just the act of producing children, but the act of mothering is not only limited to a singular category of people. I am so blessed by the relationships that I've had with all kind of uh, womanists and, you know, Pastor Donna and, and Christina Cleveland, these other folk out here who, who over time have continued to help push my own thinking around how mothering is a divine characteristic. It is a one of many ways that God describes God's relationship to us. That in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13, God says, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. That on this day where we celebrate mothers and caregivers, I want you to appreciate, child of God, that this act of mothering is an extension of God's divine character. And in a world that would seek to limit God's description through a only male or patriarchal kind of set of descriptions, I want you to know that it's necessary and helpful if you and I began to see God as mother as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one, of, one of my good friends, Dr. Yolanda Pierce, she uh, is a, a pen, one of these Pentecostal theologian uh, type folks. She's the dean of Howard University's Divinity School. She says, I knew that if God was real, if God truly loved me as a parent loves a child, then God was also mother and not only father. Only years of dogma and doctrine force you to unlearn what you know to be true in your own heart, demanding father as the only acceptable appellation and concept for God. It was such an interesting conversation that I was having with folks a couple years ago. And, you know, I was kind of thinking, oh, you guys are just kind of, you know, just, just doing a whole bunch of constructive theology. That's okay for you. Mm -hmm. But then I began to kind of dive deep into some of my own theological sources and, 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 and excavated all kinds of great things that helped to re-inscribe and reinforce how even in the earliest years of Christian faith, people, theologians, church leaders were describing God as mother. In the second century, Clement of Alexandria actually mixed metaphors in his description of, listen, Christians nursing at the breast of God the Father. And that's second century, amen. That's, that's, that, that, that's before you got here, amen. Somebody say amen, right? That, that's before you learned the creed. That's before you learned almost anything. They were already kind of wrestling with the way in which God provides this kind of maternal presence for us. Uh, one of the medieval mystics uh, describes God's activity as such. What does God do all day long? Nothing but give birth. God from all eternity lies on a, from all eternity, God lies on a maternity, what am I saying? From all, from all eternity, God lies on a maternity bed giving birth to all creation. Amen. This, this idea that one of the best ways for you and I to, to appreciate the significance of, of, of mothering and, 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 and maternal matriarchal uh, uh, gifts to our world is to expand the way in which we ascribe this not just to, to a part of the population of creation, but to all of us. That God sees mothering as a divine act and characteristic. Now it goes without saying that since Jesus was a dark-skinned Palestinian, you know that his mama had to be a black mama. <laughs> Somebody say amen, right? Man, if, if Jesus was dark-skinned, amen, that meant Mary had to have some melanin too. Which, which, which teaches us that Jesus has a special sensitivity to mothers who are dealing with a world that seeks to marginalize them. 
invisibilize them, or pose threats to their existence. I want you to think about that, right? Jesus, knowing that his coming into the world was actually through the vulnerable body of a young woman, Jesus then knows what it feels like for us who have to live in vulnerable bodies that are similar. And Jesus has a certain kind of association then with that positionality in the world. I don't know about you, but that's good news that God has this characteristic of mothering as a way to describe God's relationship to us. And then Jesus, who walked among us, also knows what it's like to be in that kind of positionality from eternity to our time. God knows what it means to be a mother and a mother caregiving type person in our world. And the scriptures bear this out. Uh, another, another great uh, uh, theologian, uh, her name was Julian of Norwich. She says, as truly as God is our father, so truly God is our mother. And it is such an amazing uh, way to now reread scripture. Because, you know, I've, I've kind of read a whole bunch of these verses my whole life. Anybody ever read scripture so much that you just kind of don't even trip off what you're reading? Do I have a few folks don't might read their Bible like that no more? To be like, you know, you know what, like, like, for instance, John 3, 16, like you open up the Bible and you're reading and you're not even reading, you're reciting. You know, it's like, you know, open up your Bible for God so loved the world that he is. And you're not reading that. You have got it so memorized that the words have lost their meaning. You ever had that kind of experience before? Well, sometimes it's necessary to change up our words. To help us reclaim and recapture what God is trying to communicate. Because, you know, I hate to burst some of y'all's bubble. God is not a man. <laughs> Wish I could talk to somebody up in here today. Maybe I'm going to talk to myself. Amen. Don't you know that, that you know, uh, any language about God in our anthropomorphic words is a demotion of God? Mm -hmm. You know, in the early, early days of the, the, the Hebrew uh, Jew. Judaistic uh, Jewish faith, they were trying to uh, have a word to describe or name God the Eternal, and they they created a four-letter word. It's called a tetra tetramogram that you cannot pronounce. Y H W H. And many of us, you know, in our interpretive spaces over the years, put vowels in there so we can say it and it's usually called Yahweh but in the earliest part of the faith that word was ineffable they could not pronounce it it was purposely written in that way by the scribes because they realized anytime I try to name the transcendent one I am actually demoting the transcendent one Amen. And so they, they use descriptions to try and make sure that people know you're talking about the eternal and you're talking about God, you're talking about Yahweh, you're talking about the Lord, you're talking about Father. These are descriptions of the ineffable one. And over time, we have married male language to God as if God is a man. But I want you to know God showing up ain't like me or any of you brothers <laughs> in this room. Amen. How many know God is beyond us? Amen. And because God is beyond us, every word we use to talk about God should open our imagination to how God seeks to reveal God's self to us. So then I read scripture a little bit differently when I read Ruth chapter 2 verse 12 that says, May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings... You have come to take refuge. Or Psalms uh, 17 and 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye, O God. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Or how about Isaiah 42? For a long time, God says, I have kept silent. I've been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp, and I pant. I mean, that's a different kind of description of God. That when you are in trouble, God is saying, like a woman who is giving childbirth, this is how much uh, connection I have to your trial. 
Man, that, that brought some alive for me. Or, or I read Isaiah 66, verse 13, but I'll read it again. As a mother comforts her child, so I, the God of all creation, will comfort you. It is so important for you and I to appreciate it on a day like today when we acknowledge mothers and caregivers that we don't forget that the act of mothering is a divine characteristic in and of itself. And it is worth our celebration and honor. We should see it as a sacred act. And then we should make the rest of our lives ensuring that mothers, moms, caregivers, those who fill these roles are never in a vulnerable place where they cannot fulfill the divine act of mothering. Somebody say amen. So as I look at the scripture, I, 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 I thought this would be an, a, an amazing passage uh, rather than trying to uh, search for my traditional Mother's Day passage. I looked at the lectionary and I, and I stumbled upon this passage about Dorcas, who was obviously a woman who followed Jesus. It is not clear if she had children. It's not. It's certainly clear she's not married. But it may suggest that she was because she hung out with widows. And widows in, in this time uh, were usually most vulnerable if they did not have children or those who were there to take care of them. And so they usually formed these kind of uh, 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 groups of, of, of community and, and support. And you find in this story Dorcas uh, uh, being a wonderful expression of mothering even to other adults, that her caretaking and her caregiving in this text is seen, listen, my first point, as an act of discipleship. And that's what I want us to appreciate for this first point, that mothering is an act of discipleship. In the text, it says that she was a disciple who was devoted to good works and acts of charity. Can you imagine how easy it is for us to forget that to offer uh, acts of love and charity should not be something limited to one sect or population of people, but all of us are called as followers of Jesus to extend this kind of activity of good works and charity. I love uh, the Palestinian activist uh, that I became familiar with when I was in Palestine. She says, mothering is an act of defiance in the midst of a colonizing empire. That to say that I am going to do good and be charitable in a world that is constantly trying to take life away from us is an act of defiance. It is an act of boldness saying that I refuse to let death and despair and the kind of forces of this world steal me from the act of discipleship that requires me to take care of those God has left in my charge. And I'm here to tell you that's one of the great gifts I've learned through the years as a pastor and as a community leader. I've sat with mothers and caregivers and individuals who stand in the gap on behalf of people who are either their own children or folks that they just made a commitment to love. And I've watched them stand in the gap against all odds. Why? Because they believe that there's a call on their life to extend care even in the face of death. I mean, I've sat in rooms, courtrooms, and, 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 and hospital rooms, and, 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 and on the front line of protests, and I've watched mothers, amen, just, just, just be more bowed than me. And I'm supposed to be the one, amen, because that, that, I, I, you know, I, I stood in, in courtrooms with brothers and young, young cats, and I knew they was guilty, amen. I just, I'd be like, Lord, don't give them justice, amen, because they in trouble. Somebody say amen. Give them mercy. And I've watched mothers just continue to pour their everything into their children or these young people that they know and love. I remember when me and, and uh, uh, Lady Sharice and a few others of the Mary Pastor Nisha, we used to be at the continuation school. And Sister Nancy was the mother of Berkeley. 
<laughs> Amen. And uh, she, she was one of our moms who uh, was featured during our Easter Sunday service on stage, and she lost her own child to gun violence. You remember her story. And, and, and because of her deep pain and her loss, she had this capacity to extend love to children all across the city of Berkeley. And they would just call her Mama Nancy. And when we was go in, in school and the kids was acting up, and none of us could do much. We'd be like, y'all better go call Sister Nancy. <laughs> Sister Nancy come walking in, what is going on? And the kids eat the most rowdy ones. It'd be like, Mama Nancy, and they, some break down, start crying. Like, I need to take whatever you got and put that in my back pocket, praise the Lord. Just pull that out whenever it's necessary. That there is a gift, there is a contribution that is unique, that is grounded in love, in charity, in good works, and its description, its feeling is often beyond a value, a, 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 a price tag. Anybody ever had that kind of love impact your life? Amen. The love of a matriarch, a caretaker, and you couldn't put any, any, any real value to it, but you just knew that it was the thing that set you free from a season of bondage and pain. What would it look like if you and I took seriously that we all have this call to engage in this kind of mothering? That we are called to ensure that we are giving life and engaging in acts of charity. So much so that when Peter shows up, the first response of the widows whom she was taking care of was to show Peter what she did to take good care of them. And I just feel challenged, like, God, what would people show of me, of us, of our church, of your family, of our community, as evidence that we are mothering creation? To follow Jesus means that we got to take good care of everything that is created. We don't get to opt out because they may not have my last name or my skin tone or live in my part of town or believe what I believe or, or act the way I act. No, I am called as a follower of Jesus, whether I'm a teacher, whether I'm an a, 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 a active, activist or organizer, a parent, a big mama, a mentor. I am called to mother creation. I don't know about you, but that is a great gift and opportunity for us to lean into. If I had a question for you today, one of the questions that, that I would love uh, for you to think about, how are we being called to engage in the mothering of all creation? And listen, who around you is in need of this act of discipleship? If, if, if there's one thing I can get you to leave here today saying, mothering is an act of discipleship. It is an act of faithfulness to God. And so when you run into moms, mothers, caregivers, caretakers, lovers, and matriarchs, how can we see their model and say, God, may I be faithful to that? Second thing that I, I want to lift up, mothering often puts us in proximity to suffering. I mean, I was struck in this passage how the scripture says that Dorcas became ill and died. It does not say how she became ill, does not say what caused her death, and it left all kind of space in my imagination to think about all the ways that, that, that moms and mothers and women in particular are made vulnerable in this season and culture of death. The way death visits mothers and caregivers. Uh, I, I was doing some reading and, 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 and became very familiar with all of the, the high rates of uh, uh, mortality among black moms and, and how uh, they can uh, suffer death and a terrible experience of delivering during pregnancy because the systems of medicine uh, do not often extend to them the kind of care. And so there's this disproportionate number of black moms who are dying in childbirth. And I was just so struck by that. Uh, we, we were in, in Los Angeles for a gun violence prevention summit that I was hosting, and Judge Judy Hatchett, or is it Hatchett or Hackett? Hatchett? Judge, no. 
Glenda, what's the, what's the black judge? You, uh, <laughs> judge Hatchet, right? Glenda, not Judy. Well, the, the black judge on TV. <laughs> Woman judge. Y'all forgive me, my brain just. Come on, come on, you good. You good. It, was, it was fascinating because while we were there, she came and told me she was actually there also to lead a protest because one of her children or, or family members had died in the LA hospital, giving birth to a baby. And I just was so struck, and that's at that experience with her, she said, this is more normal than you think. And I began to research, and I began to see that just like Dorcas in this story, engaging in acts of mothering, we also have moms all around us whose lives are vulnerable. Not just in the act of childbearing, but also in the process of child rearing. Amen. That when you lose your child to violence, how many of you know that is death visiting you? When you have your children or child caught in the cycles of violence or abuse or addiction or incarceration, that that can be an experience of death visiting you. And so to be a mother or a mom or a caregiver or someone who engages in the act of mothering, it requires you and I to always see the ways mothering brings us closer to the suffering and then invites us to relieve that suffering and not allow it to persist as if it is only their job alone to solve. I mean, it, it, it has changed my whole thinking around some of these debates around uh, uh, the, the access to reproductive justice. And, and, and I encourage you, you should watch this, this great episode tonight. Uh, I mean, you can find it in many other places as well, but I, I saw Kamal Bell's episode uh, that he's doing tonight on reproductive justice. And it was a, such a fascinating episode that talked about how there are so many moms and women across the country who are not having access to, to full care and full uh, support to, to make the right decisions for their own bodies and, and, and that that in and of itself is keeping mothers from being able to have the full agency they need to make decisions that bless their own lives. And it was interesting because, you know, there was some folks who were, you know, trying to engage in this argument about how we have to protect and support the life of the, the, the unborn and the babies in the mother's womb. And, and, I, and I came to this conclusion that the best way to protect the life growing within a mother is to protect the body and agency of that mother. Because in protecting the body and agency of that mother, that mother can then make sure that the necessary support and health is extended to her first. Somebody say amen, right? I mean, in, in, in this thing, and I, I won't go into it too far, but they were talking about how they were, they were criminalizing mothers or those who were going to be giving birth with this fake, uh, you know, kind of uh, allegiance to the baby in the womb. And it was like, how can you... Uh, criminalize one and say you're trying to support the other. No, that's a lot of, a lot of schizo, just mixed up thinking. <laughs> and it's mostly men, amen, just doing too much. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> and so part of what this means is that if these struggles are real for caregivers and mothers, then their struggle must become our struggle. It must force us to not invisibilize them or erase them. But we must figure out how can we every day, listen, directly interrupt and alleviate the burden of mothers and caregivers. That's what it means to me when I, when I, when I declare that mothering is an act of discipleship. Mothering makes us proximal to the suffering of others. It means that when we get close to their suffering, we then must commit to alleviating it. Last thing I'll say, if it is indeed the case that moms are sources of life, caregivers provide these glimpses of hope that may be beyond our ability to see, 
then I want to say that mothers and caretakers always can benefit from a season of resurrection. They can always benefit from a season of new life. I love in this passage how Peter, you know, is welcomed to help speak life into this situation that has been afflicted or visited by death. It's so powerful to see that Peter kneels and prays when he shows up. And he speaks directly to the body of Dorcas and says, get up. And immediately she opens her eyes, sits up. And Peter took her hand, helped her up. And then he called in the believers and the widows, listen, and presented her to them alive. There's so much in this passage, this one verse, this one point that can be a prescription for how we should engage in the act of mothering even to those who are tasked with providing life to us all. When's the last time you prayed for that person in your life who has been a source of life and encouragement for you? Are we as in tune with them as they are with us? Amen. My wife did a, did a, a wonderful, wonderful kind of just testimony and description of the importance of self-care. But how many know sometimes it's hard for those who give much to practice self-care? So what does it look like for all of us who are takers? <laughs> so I say, man. How many know you're surrounded by some takers? Amen. Well, they just take, take, take. They don't even, they'd be like, man, give me a break. <laughs> what does it mean for you to switch your taker hat off and you start to be a giver of life to the ones who have given you life? What does it mean to center those who love you and provide for you and give you much? Take them by the hand. Meet them at their most difficult moment. Touch them with tenderness and love. And then present them to those that they know as alive. Child of God, I, I hope today that, if nothing else, you can remember that it is God's desire to resurrect mothers, caregivers, sources of hope and life all around us. And that as God brings us into deeper relationship with one another, may we also see this as a muscle memory response to everything that is around us. You don't have to be in a great relationship with your biological mother to be a caregiver or mother to others. You don't have to be this perfect child <laughs> in order to be a good mentor to someone else. You don't have to be anything but just willing and open and with the same love that God has loved you and I, with the same kind of mothering that God has extended to us, may we extend that to the loved ones God places in our life. And may we bring life. May we bring hope. May we bring healing. All of these divine actions that ignite the act of mothering around us. Come on, let's stand to our feet, everyone, and let's just take a few moments and ask God. To help us grab the hand of someone next to you. storage is empty and I am available to you. God, I pray for the hand that I'm touching today. Lord, I pray that on this day when we have celebrated mothers and caregivers in these matriarchal roles that so many play in our life as mentors and helpers 
and all the spectrum of emotions, Lord God, celebration, Lord God, some, Lord God, have some tension, some have a bit of foreboding. God, all of these, Lord, we hold them together and we realize, God, that you are a mother to us. You are a, 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 a source of life and a source of help and a source of strength. Lord God, as you are so rightly described in the text, you seek to gather us like a hen gathers her chicks and hide us under your wings. You seek to comfort us as a mother comforts her child. So God, today I pray that you will comfort the hand that I'm touching today. I pray, God, that everything that they have need of today, God, that your love, your divine love, your unique love, your special love, your touch, God, would penetrate their most deepest and harmful spaces. I pray, God, that you will bring life, Lord, where there seems to be none. I pray that you will bring hope where there seems to be little. I pray that you will bring strength and power where there is weakness. I pray, God, that even in this moment as I touch them, God, that you will pass to them what they need to be blessed so they can indeed be a blessing. I thank you for every mother in this place once again. Thank you for every grandmother. Thank you for the intergenerational roles that matriarchs and women and caregivers play. Thank you, God, that they see us beyond our worst selves. Thank you that they can make ways out of no way and they can do things, Lord, that seem impossible and they can make, Lord God, a little become much. Thank you for the miracle inherent in the gift of moms how they can love us through great trials and tribulations god we say thank you but god i also pray that that same gift would be extended to us that special unique gift may it be a part of who we are in a world looking for your tender touch of love lift those hands right where you're standing and so now it's me god and i stand in the need of prayer it is not my mother, it is not my father, my sister, it is not my brother, but it's me, Lord, and I need you, God. Touch me. Lord, as we are so described, Lord, touch me. Bring life to me. Bring hope and healing and make me available, Lord God, to be used by you and ignite this gift of mothering and stewardship in the world. We thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for this occasion. Make it real to us. And we'll say thank you, Lord. We'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them, thank God for your mothering. Thank God for your mothering. Thank God for your mothering. Ask your gifts. Thank God for them. Thank God for them. Thank God for them. Thank God for them.